Good evening, folks. It's 6 p.m. We'll give it a few minutes and let people join that uh, might be getting home from work or just getting done with dinner, and then we'll get started. Well, we've given a few minutes. It's 6.03. Hopefully folks have had a chance to join in. I see we have just a few attendees. Um, we'll go through some housekeeping and then I'll introduce myself and we'll get going. So Leah, did you want to walk folks through the housekeeping? Sure. Uh, today's session is being recorded and will be available on our website for viewing by, the uh, by close of business tomorrow. All attendees are muted upon entry. If you have questions or comments for staff, please hold them until the public comment period. At that time, you can state them live by raising your hand. If you're calling in, you can raise your hand by dialing star nine on your phone. And if you're on a computer, you can find the hand icon at the bottom of your screen. Sometimes, depending on Zoom versions, you may first need to click the reactions tab before you can see the hand function. When it is time for comments and questions, we encourage you to speak up and provide your comments live. To speak, uh, you will need to raise your hand. At that point, I will... Um, enable you to unmute yourself. If you were dialing in star six again, um, if you're on a phone, you may also submit a question um, via the chat if you have an inability tonight, but we do, um, we would prefer them live. Um, to ensure that we can hear from everybody, please limit your comments and questions to um, three minutes. And if you have any technical difficulties or questions, please reach out directly to me in the chat function. Chris, go ahead. Thank you, Leah. Um, my name is Chris Donnelly. I'm the Regional Fish Program Manager here in Region 1 in Spokane. Uh, today's date is, is August 22nd. It is 6.04 p.m. And for the record, joining me here are Bill Baker, my District Fisheries Biologist in, in Colville, and Leah Snyder, an administ Administrative Assistant out of Olympia. Um, for point of fact, we are here to discuss Lake, Roose Lake Roosevelt uh, white sturgeon rulemaking. Um, if you're here for any other reason, feel free to stay, but we're going to talk about white sturgeon tonight, and hopefully you're not disappointed about that. And um, again, I'll reiterate that we'd like to take both questions and comments. I think what we'll do is for folks that have comments or testimony, we'll give you three minutes. Um, if you'd like to testify or comment, please raise your hand. 
and Leah will record you in the order that you uh, raised your hand. If it's reserved to questions, I think we'll do the same thing, but we'll take that after testimony. So with that, I think I'll open it to Bill Baker, District Fisheries Biologist, and Bill, uh, take away your presentation, please. Thanks, Chris. Give me just a second here to get uh, get this thing loaded up. Let me know when that shows up uh, on your end, if you will. I can see it, Bill. I think you're fine. Okay, great. Great. Okay. Um, hi, folks. Uh, as Chris said, my name is Bill Baker. I work for Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife as a district fish biologist covering Ferry, Stevens, and Pondray counties. And tonight I'll be talking with you about white sturgeon in Lake Roosevelt and proposed changes to the sturgeon fishery. I'm going to start by giving you some background information on the sturgeon population and some of the issues it faces, and then I'll talk about uh, the work that's currently being done to rebuild that population. I'll also provide a summary of the fishery in recent years, um, and I'll wrap up sort of by talking about um, where we go from here. So let's begin here uh, by taking a look at the sturgeon population in Lake Roosevelt, or to be specific, the population which extends um, from Lake Roosevelt upstream into that portion of the Columbia River in Canada downstream of Hugh Keenly Side Dam. Now, altogether, this is an area that we refer to as the transboundary reach. A sturgeon in the transboundary reach have experienced persistent recruitment failure since around the early 1970s. Every year, adult sturgeon spawn and produce eggs and larvae, but they disappear during the larval stage. Now, the result of this over a roughly 50-year period is that we have an aging adult population with very few young fish filling in behind. So uh, this slide just shows an example of what the sturgeon population looked like uh, in the late 1990s. Uh, on the x-axis here is the fork length of uh, sturgeon in the population, and on the y-axis is the proportion of the population of a given size. And you can see here that uh, even in the 1990s, there were very few uh, smaller, younger fish. Now, because of this, sturgeon were closed to harvest in the U.S. and Lake Roosevelt in 1995. And this was followed by a closure um, of the fishery altogether, even to catch and release in 2002. Now in Canada, the situation's been uh, even worse. White sturgeon were listed under the Species at Risk uh, Act, or SARA, in 2006. That's the Canadian equivalent of our Endangered Species Act here in the U.S. In 2001, the Canadians began use of conservation aquaculture or hatchery rearing as a stopgap measure to prevent extirpation of the population. Um, the goals were to maintain genetic diversity and to rebuild the demographics, that is the size and age structure of the population. On the U.S. side, WDFW and the Spokane and Colville tribes began stocking of sturgeon in Lake Roosevelt in 2004, initially with fish provided by BC, um, but then with our own fish beginning in 2006. Both the U.S. and Canadian programs relied on direct gamete take, um, that is, capture of adult brood stock, which were brought back to the hatchery and spawned. Progeny were reared in the hatchery and released uh, the following year. In 2011, the U.S. program transitioned to capture and rearing of wild-caught larvae, which was advantageous for a couple of reasons. From a genetics perspective, those larvae that were caught in the wild represented better genetic diversity and a far greater number of parents. In addition, broodstock collection, which is labor-intensive and hard on adult fish, was no longer necessary. So I'll come back to this in, in just a bit and discuss that uh, in more detail. Well, this next slide shows the number of sturgeon released from hatcheries in Canada and the U.S. since the programs began. On the x-axis here uh, is the brood year uh, or year class. That's the year that the fish were produced. And on the y-axis is the number of fish released. In the legend, you can see that we have fish originating from both Canada and the U.S. 
DGT um, refers to direct gamete take. That is, again, fish that are produced from eggs and mill to obtain from adult broodstock, which were captured and brought back to the hatchery to spawn. Uh, the others, the Canadian wild and USWCL, uh, refer to wild-caught eggs and larvae used in later years, and I'll talk more about those in just a bit. And you can see that in the early years, uh, the Canadians released a lot of direct gamete-take fish, shown here by the blue bars. Here on the U.S. side, shown in gray, our stocking program consisted of about 4,000 fish annually through 2010. Now, as I mentioned earlier, these direct gamete take fish represented a very limited number of parents, and they, they also experienced far higher survival than anticipated, something like 86% for the first year, and then about 98% each year thereafter. Now, because of that high survival, many of the hatchery uh, direct gamete take individual year classes were more abundant than the entire wild adult population. And because of their limited genetics, we realized that as these fish age toward maturity, they represented a genetic risk to the wild population, something that we refer to as genetic swamping. Now, to avoid that occurring, we reopened the Lake Roosevelt sturgeon fishery in 2017 and focused harvest on those specific year classes of fish. And that fishery was very well attended. People came out of the woodwork to fish that first year, and a lot of fish were harvested, which was good because that was the goal. The next year, I have a graph showing. Um, oh, sorry, skipped ahead. Next year, I have a graph showing estimated sturgeon harvest in Lake Roosevelt from 2017 to 2022 using a couple of different methods. Uh, catch record cards, which are shown here in blue and um, the Lake Roosevelt Creel Survey, which is shown in gray. Um, and you'll see that there's, there's pretty good general agreement between the two methods. Um, on this graph, the, the year is shown here on the x-axis and the, and the number of fish harvested for that year is on the y-axis. In 2017, we estimate that somewhere around 2,500 to 3,500 or so sturgeon were harvested. And at that point, we knew that we had sufficient fishing power uh, to reduce those overrepresented fish. So the following year, we tightened the slot limit to 53 to 63 inches in order to focus harvest on those fish which were closest to sexual maturity and therefore represented the greatest immediate genetic risk. And we maintained that for a couple of years and saw a modest uh, harvest of around 250 to 500 or so sturgeon in 2018, and then again in 2019. In 2020, we loosened the slot just a bit to 50 to 63 inches, and we maintained that through 2022. In those years, <clears throat> uh, we've seen similar uh, fishing effort and harvest. And to date, there have been approximately four to 5,000 sturgeon harvested in the recreational fishery in Lake Roosevelt. And that has resulted in a substantial reduction in overrepresented year classes and led to family equalization. Now, this graph is from a report put together by our Canadian counterparts, which reached that conclusion. I won't go into the details of it here, um, except to say that the broad scale conclusion was that the, the risk of genetic swamping was avoided. So kudos to our angling base, which solved what could have been a major problem. So earlier, I mentioned that we transitioned from direct gamete take to wild-caught larvae in 2011 after we reared and released a small pilot test group in 2010. Now, this next slide shows how those larvae are collected. And this work is conducted by the Spokane and Colville tribes, and then they bring the larvae back to uh, the WDFW Sherman Creek Fish Hatchery for rearing. They use large D-ring drift nets fish near the bottom. Larval sturgeon hide during the day, but drift with the current to disperse at night and are captured in the nets, which also catch a lot of other debris. The larvae are then sorted out and placed in containers and transported back to the hatchery. Okay. So, um, so I want to come back to this graph for just a moment, which again shows the number of sturgeon released from the hatchery programs. But now I want to focus on the right-hand portion of the graph where you start to see uh, these gold bars. 
Now these represent wild caught larvae. And as I mentioned before, use of wild caught larvae offered a number of advantages for a conservation type program. However, when we transitioned to them, we had some initial growing pains. So remember that these are wild fish, which had to be trained on the hatchery feed. And for the first few years of releases, we did not have sufficient hatchery infrastructure to rear these fish to the same size at release as the previous direct gamete take fish. And size at release is a key factor in survival. So generally speaking with, with sturgeon uh, release into Lake Roosevelt or into the transboundary reach, the larger, the better. For year classes produced between 2011 and 2016, fish were generally fewer in number and smaller in size at release, which translated into poor survival. Thus, we have approximately six year classes of concern for which um, there's a limited number of individuals. Now, by the 2017 year class, we largely had the collection and infrastructure challenges figured out. And from that point forward, the program has been pretty stable. And because every sturgeon stock has a pit tag, we can identify individuals that are caught once they're in Lake Roosevelt, either in the fishery or in stock assessment sampling. So we have a really good idea of length of age, uh, which is shown here in this graph with age here on the x-axis and uh, fork length of the fish here on the y-axis. Now, as you'll recall, the harvest slot for the last three years has been 50 to 63 inches. And the direct gamete take fish generally began recruiting into the bottom end of that slot at around eight to nine years of age. And for the first four or so year classes of wild caught larvae, their growth lagged just a bit, possibly due to a slow start because of small size of the leaves. But for later year classes, growth seems to be tracking uh, pretty similarly to what we saw for direct gamete take fish. And as of last year, we had eight year old wild caught larvae that were nearly 50 inches. Um, so I'll come back to this shortly, but the bottom line is it's now time to move the bottom end of the slot in order to offer some protection for these weaker year classes. Okay, so, so next up here, um, we'll shift gears and talk a little bit about the wild adult population. Now this graph shows uh, projected abundance of wild adult sturgeon through 2032 based on survival estimates from stock assessment. On the x-axis is the year and on the y-axis is the number of adults. And as you can see here, um, we have more wild adult sturgeon like Roosevelt than in the Canadian reach, but the mortality rate is also higher. And at the current rate, we anticipate that we'll have fewer than 500 uh, adults left uh, by 2027. And one of the concerns is that non-harvest uh, fishery impacts, for example, hooking mortality may play a role in speeding up this decline. And we wanna maintain this original wild uh, adult stock as long as we can. Well, this graph here uh, shows the average water temperature in the upper portion of Lake Roosevelt for the past 10 years. Um, on the x-axis is the date and on the y-axis is temperature. And you can see uh, that over the past few years, the sturgeon fishing season has occurred during the summer and early fall when water temperatures are, are pretty much at their peak, generally something over 60 degrees Fahrenheit. And because sturgeon are cold-blooded animals, uh, there is a strong relationship between water temperature and handling stress. So when fish are caught, the incidence of mortality is, is higher when water temperatures are elevated. Now, water temperatures in Lake Roosevelt begin to drop around mid-September, and, uh, and they continue um, to drop throughout the fall and winter months. So a sturgeon fishery during this period represents less risk to the wild adult population. Okay. So let's take a minute and recap what we've discussed. Um, the conservation aquaculture program has been extremely successful at maintaining the white sturgeon population, in Lake Roosevelt and the upper Columbia River. Um, we did have a problem with overrepresented year classes of direct gamete take fish in the population, but that problem was solved by anglers and genetic swamping was avoided. Uh, currently, uh, we have some weaker year classes of wild caught larvae that are beginning to enter the lower end of the 50 to 63 inch slot, which has been in place the last three years. 
Uh, we also have declining abundance of wild adult surgeon occurring, occurring more rapidly in the U.S. and non-harvest related impacts from the fishery like hooking mortality could be contributing. So what will the Lake Roosevelt sturgeon fishery look like for the next few years? Well, we're proposing to implement some conservation measures to protect uh, the early year classes of wild caught larvae as well as wild adults, including a shortened fishing season, uh, moving to a fall fishery to take advantage of cooler water temperatures, which in turn results in less stress on non-harvested fish and a gradual tightening of the slot limit over the next six years or so, followed by a period of catch and release uh, fishing only. Um, we'll resume harvest when the 2017 year class is of sufficient size, but we'll have to do that while also limiting impacts to the weaker 2011 to 2016 year classes. So for 2023, the sturgeon season will run from September 16th through November 30th, and the harvest slot will be 53 to 63 inches fork length. Most of the other rules which have been in place over the past few seasons will remain the same, including a daily limit of one fish and a two fish annual limit statewide. Anglers must stop fishing for the day after the daily limit is taken and for the season after the annual limit has been taken. Catch record cards will still be required and sturgeon will, and sturgeon will remain closed to night fishing. Uh, other statewide rules for sturgeon will also apply. Now, because the, the fishing season does not overlap with spawning, all of Lake Roosevelt, including that portion of China Bend, uh, that portion from China Bend upstream to the Canadian border will be open to fishing. Uh, the 2023 um, rule flew just uh, just recently here um, as an E-Ray. Okay, um, next up, this slide just shows uh, what the anticipated harvest slot and fishing seasons um, would look like for the next few years. Now, these these scenarios. Um, represent our current best guess, but they may be subject to modification as additional information becomes available. So none of this is, is set in stone. Rather, we wanted to provide an idea of what the seasons uh, and slot limits would look like as we adjust regulations to protect the population while, while simultaneously providing opportunity. As a reminder, um, we'll transition to a fall fishery this year, as I mentioned on the previous slide, and we do intend to maintain a 53 to 63 inch slot for, for 2023 and likely 2024. In 2025, we anticipate that, uh, that we'll bump the bottom end of the slot up to 55 inches and maintain that through 2026. Beginning in 2027 and extending to 2028, the bottom end of the slot will be bumped upward again, uh, this time to 57 inches. Now, following that, beginning in 2029, um, we'll enter a period of catch and release only to protect uh, wild caught larvae year classes of concern, which cannot withstand harvest. We anticipate that, uh, that we will be able to provide harvest opportunity again by sometime around 2031, but the details of slot limit and, and fishing season cannot be determined that far in advance. Um, so uh, we'll use a combination of stock assessment data and modeling to inform what the fishery will look like as we get a bit closer. Okay, um, that's all I have. I, I do want to take a moment and thank our tribal partners, the Spokans and the Colvilles, um, and our angling public. Uh, without you, the successes that we've seen in this program would not have been possible. Also want to acknowledge the Bonneville Power Administration for funding of sturgeon work in Lake Roosevelt. And I want to thank our partners in Canada, uh, the BC Ministry of Forest, Lands, and Natural Resource Operations, BC Hydro, the Freshwater Fisheries Society of BC and the Department of Fisheries and Oceans Canada for their cooperative efforts and a, a lot of really great work to support sturgeon in the transboundary reach. And with that, um, we can uh, we can entertain any questions. Thank you. Oh, Chris, you're muted. Uh, apologies, everybody. Thank you, Bill. I uh, maybe stop sharing your screen, and then um, Leah will go to the order in which you received um, folks that want to talk or ask questions. Great. Sounds great. 
so this is the time when you can feel free to comment or ask questions. Um, if you're on Zoom, you might need to toggle down to the reactions tab. It's a smiley face with a plus sign down at the bottom of your screen. Um, or if it's, you might just need to click on your, your name if you can see that. Um, if you are in, or if you're on a phone and you've dialed in, uh, star nine to raise your hand. And if you're having any issues, you can send a message in the chat. <clears throat> Doesn't look like we have anybody yet. Let's give it a couple minutes. Uh, maybe folks will um, have a thought come to mind. We're here to answer any questions. I think it's fairly clear uh, where we're headed for 2023 and into the future, at least for the next five or six years. Um, appreciate the presentation, Bill. Um, and uh, the public should anticipate that um, what Bill proposed with fall fisheries and tightening slots will be uh, what's coming in the near future. Leah, I think we'll give it till 6.30. And if we don't hear any uh, questions or, or feedback from public, we'll end at that point. That sounds great. Just a reminder, smiley face reactions tab at the bottom of your screen to raise your hand. Um, and if you're having any issues, you can click the chat button and I can help you out. I see one hand raised, Leah. And we have a hand. Uh, looks like our hand is Jeff. Jeff, go ahead. Yeah, um, I was just going to let you know that on my end, it says the chat's disabled. Uh, I tried to hit the chat. But is there anything going on below Grand Coulee Dam? Uh, Chief Joseph on down, Rufus for Sturgeon? Yeah, um, good question. So there aren't any fisheries offered currently, but as part of the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission licensing for those PUD dams, there's a requirement to rear and release sturgeon in the wells pool, um, as well as the uh, mid-sea pools all the way down to, to Wanapum and, and actually Priest Rapids. Um, and there are fish being stocked in those pools, and at some point they're going to grow into catchable sizes, and there will be some sort of fishery formulated there. A, a lot of that will be based on survival, uh, stock assessment to no abundance, and then some way to offer fisheries. Um, I wouldn't anticipate just based on the size of those reservoirs that it'll be the same scale as what we have in Lake Roosevelt, probably smaller. Um, and some of the things that we learned about, about direct gamete take fish, uh, those lessons were transferred to the mid-sea pools, and so they started with larval fish from the start. And they haven't necessarily had some of those uh, genetic swamping risks that we've seen there. Having said that, um, you may remember there was a fishery in the Wanapum pool that was essentially the same thing as Lake Roosevelt, where they had overrepresented hatchery fish there that they wanted to get out. So, um, yeah, things are coming. Um, sturgeon grow slowly. They grow, they grow even more slowly in the mid-sea pools than they do in Lake Roosevelt. But uh, I've heard multiple conversations in the last couple of years about how we're going to structure fisheries there. And I would think in the next, gosh, five, less than 10 years, um, you'll see some sort of fisheries offered there. And then uh, Rufus Woods received surplus fish that we have from Lake Roosevelt. Um, we haven't done any kind of stock assessment work down there or really looked at sturgeon growth. They've just been kind of getting fish when we have um, extras. It's a place where we know sturgeon historically existed prior to the construction of Chief Joe. Um, so I can't say whether something's coming for Rufus Woods in the near future, but I think as abundances go up there, we'll start to look at whether there's any fishery opportunity in the future. Thank you. 
You're welcome. And I apologize for that. The chat is enabled. I actually must have turned that off when I was turning off some other things today, uh, but you can access it now for sure. Sorry about that. And last chance for hands. Um, raise hand function at the bottom of your screen. And you could, or you could use the chat function this time. We have a problem. <laughs> well, I think I'm going to put an end to this. Um, Jeff and Joel, you're our last two attendees here, and I appreciate you taking the time to plug into our public process. It's nice to have the public care about the resource and take time out of their busy schedule to uh, hear what we're up to. Appreciate your attendance tonight, and Jeff, I appreciate your question. Um, as always, uh, we are available. Um, Monday through Friday at our offices, Region 1 um, in Spokane. You have my name and you have Bill's name. Feel free to reach out to us, and we would be more than happy to uh, address any questions that you have. Um, I think with that, we'll close out. Thank everybody for being here and uh, wish you all a, a happy evening. Have a good night. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Joel.